Hello and welcome to the Das Nostalgia Podcast, episode 4. As usual, I'm your host, Anatoly, and today I have a very, very special guest with me for your listening pleasure. Sir, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jim Leonard, known in some scenes as Trickster and in other scenes as the co-founder of MobyGames.com. Oh, excellent. So, Jim is here today to take us back in time. Uh, all the way <laughs> back, <laughs> all the way back to the beginning. So, uh, um, take it away, sir. <laughs> well, what I I uh, I think I, the way we got connected initially is that I I remember listening to your first three podcasts and thinking uh, uh, not only that you're doing a fantastic job, but also that um, uh, it seems as if uh, your experience maybe started 1990 and later. Uh, especially uh, noted by the the title of your podcast, which is the DOS, uh, you know, DOS nostalgia. And uh, I'm un- unfortunately older than you <laughs> by about ten years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember the birth of the PC, the IBM PC. That was sort of my beginning, and uh, the games that I grew up with. I mean, I was exposed to other stuff too, like the Apple and and actually the very first machine I ever touched was an Osborne CPM machine. But uh, my childhood was the PC growing up, and uh, I just thought it'd be fun to talk about uh, games before DOS, actually. Or, well, not before DOS, but games that don't actually even use DOS. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, just the first decade of PC gaming. So, uh, so here I am. All right. Well, sounds uh, wonderful. Well, I don't know um, if, if I ever made it. Uh, I probably should point out, since uh, the whole 1990s thing came out, uh, it is true because you know I'm from a different country, and you know while the while the Iron Curtain was up, we really had no import of technology. So I grew up with a technology that was like 20, 30 years behind. You know, like in <laughs> the true. 80s, people still you know you'd go to like a computer class, and the teacher would like you know hang out you know literally punch cards and uh, oh, wow. show you where where all the layout is, and you know how to use punch cards to to to, to feed them into mainframes. Um, and you know the Iron Curtain fell, and then in the eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety. That's when I got to experience basically all technology, like twenty years worth of technology in about two years. <laughs> so like I've touched it all basically, uh, but uh, like you know I for, from punch cards uh, to you know computers, you know like the to the Spectrum clones uh, with tape and. Uh, uh, it, it was all so very fast. Like the, I've seen, like you know, uh, the NXT, and then like uh, a year later, I'd be working on a 386. You know, like something that's the, the span. Like it was yeah. all so, so you, condensed. Your experience. Uh, it sounds like your experience was compressed. Yes, very, very much what, so. What I experienced in ten years, you experienced in one or two. But because so of you... that, I also missed out on on a whole bunch of stuff. Obviously, because certain stuff that by that point was obsolete or not in use anymore never really got through the borders. So uh, that's where you know I'm missing out. So all right, so I'm ready. Well, I mean, you know, I could probably start with the uh, the introduction of the PC if you like. I mean, not a lot of people realize it was uh, a lot of people think of the PC as the XT like something that had a hard drive but that was in 83 the mm-hmm. first PC was actually in August of 1981 and uh, it was very very expensive coming from IBM of course it was targeted mainly towards professionals it was a a personal computer but it wasn't really a home computer home computers were things like the Apple the Spectrum uh, the BBC Micro you know the, the Commodore 64 that stuff stuff that mm-hmm. was meant for uh, families and so those uh, very quickly got a, uh, a a rash of games. But the original PC was primarily targeted towards businessmen, and uh, it had a price of four thousand dollars in 1981. That's right. crazy. That's roughly double that today. So uh, and actually back then I remember uh, seeing an ad for the PC, and then uh, on television there was an ad for a car, and the car was also roughly four thousand. I was just about to say that. Yeah, probably cost <laughs> the same as the car, like a decent it, car too. Pretty much. Well, this this was an economy car. I think it was like the Toyota uh, Toyota Camry or something like that. Maybe my memory's, memory's failing me. But yeah, it was ludicrously uh, expensive. And and at launch, it didn't even have uh, the kind. Of, it didn't radically exceed any of the other machines um, unless you put more memory in it. It it came stock with 16k of RAM, right. which is hardly enough to do anything. You can pretty much boot into BASIC and that's it. Um, and then. Uh, 
you most people ordered it expanded to at least 64K, so you could load an operating system like uh, the very first version of DOS. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there weren't very many. The, the first wave of games for the PC were... Because 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 the target audience was mostly businessmen, I think most of the games you can kind of see were also targeted toward that age group or that market. So um, I'm trying to I, I don't remember what games were available on launch, but some of the first games were things like um, uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. Right. Uh, again, not necessarily a game, but a simulator. Um, Microsoft Adventure, which was a, mm -hmm. a very shameless uh, <laughs> copy of Colossal <laughs> Cave. They, yep. I'm not, not even sure they acknowledged or paid royalties to anybody. Um, but then again, I guess Colossal Cave was never truly owned by anyone other right. than uh, Crower and Williams. Uh, well, I'm probably getting those names wrong, but anyhow. Um, and uh, also a lot of um, Avalon Hill uh Games, board games that are like strategy board games translated into BASIC. Some of these games came out on other systems, um, and since they were written in BASIC there, it was relatively easy to port them to, uh, to the BASIC that came in the IBM. So not a whole lot of, uh, uh, you know, not, not, not a lot of Pac-Man clones, right. not, nothing like that. Also, uh, other than the BASIC games, um, because the initial PC was only announced with in initially up to 64K, uh, game writers wanted the full amount of the storage to themselves, so they didn't actually even use DOS. Now, I'm not sure if there's an official name for these types of games. These are games where you just simply put the disc in and turn on the machine and it boots it's the game the directly. The game itself is the operating system. Uh, when I ran in, in cracking scenes uh, in the 80s, we called them booters. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the uh, and that's actually the terminology I used uh, when I created movie games too to differentiate between uh, DOS games and PC games that don't use DOS and since that was too long I chose booters so uh, yeah they were all booters in fact the early electronic arts uh, conversions in 83, 84, and 85 those were all uh, bootable games too things like um, Archon and Dr. J and Larry Bird go one-on-one -on -one and well, pretty much, uh, gosh, almost all of them, uh, Hard Hat Mac and Pinball Construction Set and Music Construction Set, you'd put the disc in and it wouldn't, it would immediately boot to an Electronic Arts logo and then the game itself would actually load. Yeah, I uh, remember a couple of, like very early on, uh, two of my, still of my favorite games uh, to this day, the PC games, as simple as they are. Are uh, I think the, when I think of the booter titles would be the mm. uh, the original Castle Wolfenstein. Uh, ah yes, and uh, Alley Cat, of course, which is and that's true. Uh, Alley Cat was a booter a as well. Great game. It's funny. Most people who know those games, they they always call them DOS games because the way they were introduced to them was after they were cracked. Right. <laughs> so they're always a a 64k com file or a very small like 57k exe file, but. Uh, you know, for those of us who who have or had the originals, uh, they're still booters. And trust me, in Russia, it was not uncommon to see a computer without a hard drive or anything uh, up to like early '90s. So, uh, no, as, sure, as, sure. as ridiculous as it sounds, you know, that's that's where no, where it's we not were. ridiculous at all. Actually, I mean, you know, that's I got my first machine. Well, it wasn't mine. That's my my father purchased a machine for the family. Um, December of 84 and it had no hard drive and I used that machine all the way through my first year of college six or seven years later and still had no hard drive so <laughs> I got very very well versed yeah. on the trying to use uh, trying to use a system without a hard drive. That's where I learned about uh, things like uh, creating a RAM disk and copying command com to it mm -hmm. and then setting com spec to point to it. That way when you when your game was over, it wouldn't constantly ask you for to reinsert the DOS disk. It would just go back to a DOS prompt. But nice. <laughs> anyway, we can talk about that uh, some other time. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's the I mean, the hard drive. We're talking about hard drive, uh, the the PC didn't get a hard drive until two years later. That was when the XT uh, finally uh, came out with a 10 meg hard drive in it. But um, you know, games were able to run from floppies right up to about 1990. It was only when they got really to it, it was only when the playing experience became um horrible off floppies that hard drives were finally started started to be required i don't think i remember seeing a i don't think i've seen a, a game that required a hard drive install i think until 1990 the first one i remember is wing commander i don't know if you remember any something like that uh, cuz uh, i remember again being in russia i remember playing a, a whole bunch of games off the floppy disks uh so i i really um and then by that point, like when we made the jump to the hard drives, then uh, I really can't remember 
anything that uh, yeah needed yeah. it right they like absolutely needed it by the time you hit I mean VGA didn't uh, didn't help I mean most you know anything using VGA graphics so you know 256 color VGA graphics needed more space so maybe it was I mean gosh maybe King's Quest V that had a lot of graphics in it could be but uh, I think all Sierra games could be played off the uh, off the floppies uh, they could up until they started pretty much doing this CD releases and stuff like that's true very you know early that's early true. on maybe uh, like not. Uh, could you play King's Quest Five uh, floppy of the floppies? floppies? You could. I, yeah, you could. You most certainly could. Even, uh, but I, it came. You'll remember. I, I don't know if you knew this. It came um, on. I think it came on 720k, three and a half inch discs. But the only five and a quarter inch version was the high density floppies. Mm -hmm. There was no 360k. In fact, I mean, some of their games that they insisted on coming out 360k. Some of them were kind of silly. They would ship with 15 or 20 discs or right, something right. like that. So yeah, King's Quest V I think was only available on uh, 1.2s and uh, 720s. Yeah, but you could definitely play those. I remember playing all of those yeah. of floppies, all the VGA games. Uh, yeah, I guess it's like that's when they started getting kind of heavy. Yeah, uh, on on the disc usage. Yeah, Sierra had a very rabid, loyal following, so it was it was in their best interests to try to keep their product as available as possible to people who uh, uh, couldn't or wouldn't uh, upgrade their machines. <laughs> <laughs> so makes sense. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's uh, trying to think if there's anything. Uh, I mean, bootable games lasted a while um, up until roughly. I mean, being bootable was uh, an advantage not only because you had the whole machine to yourself and could do whatever you wanted, but it was also sort of a copy protection measure just in and of itself. Um, especially if you formatted one track differently or something. So you, you put it in the drive and you type DIR and nothing comes up where it says read error, and then you try to do a disk copy on it and that doesn't work either. And so up, oh, I give up. So. Uh, <laughs> At least uh, that would get rid of many of the casual pirates. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the last bootable games I remember seeing were, I want to say Metropolis in 1987. Mm -hmm. I think there was another. I think there was another bootable game that was like um, like an overhead shooter, and unfortunately the name escapes me. But that was a, oh, you know that were those. I'm sorry, take it back. Those are the ones I saw. However, there was. Um, there was a Spanish. This is where I need to do my research before coming on your show. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> there was a there was a Spanish company um, that created a few games in '89, and they were CGA only, and they were bootable as well. And I think actually that kind of goes with uh, along with your experience of of technology being slow to creep in mm -hmm. uh, to Europe. It's Absolutely. like 1980. Yeah, exactly. 1989, eight years after the PC was created, VGA was already out. Sound cards were already out. However, probably <laughs> not in Spain. Yep. And so for the Spanish market, that's they they created new games, but for the hardware that people already had. So that's probably it. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, they actually the first, the very, the, I I thought all games were booters because the f uh, the first five games I ever bought, the f the first three of them uh, were booters, and so I thought <laughs> they were all going to be this way. Um, the first game I bought for myself was, I think it was Music Construction Set, not really a game, mm -hmm. um, but I was uh, big into music and also um, uh, an admirer of music in computers. That's a whole other show we could have, so I'll try not to. <laughs> to talk about that but music construction set and then pinball construction set and then a software store opened up in a mall close to me that had um, two and a half two year old titles for discounted prices and so I was able to get uh, Buck Rogers there nice. and uh, that was also a booter and um, uh, and I don't know if you had this uh, in Russia, but uh, there was a, a one or two companies that would take uh, free or shareware games and package them up in compilations as if they were new. And uh, sometimes they would work out uh, agreements with the uh, authors, but sometimes they wouldn't. And uh, probably the one that uh, we saw most in America was Key Punch. So there were tons and tons of Key Punch compilations. And... Uh, that was uh, probably the fourth thing I ever bought. I think it was some sort of space shooting games. And then uh, the fifth one finally was Starflight, which was my first uh, DOS game that required... It didn't require, but it, 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 it operated very badly if you only had one floppy drive. So thankfully I had two, and that's, <laughs> uh, 
I played that for roughly 50 or 60 hours. <laughs> nice. Now, we did not have those uh, compilations in Russia at all. Uh, hell, we didn't even have any kind of distribution <laughs> no, you of You probably games. just copied whatever you needed. Pretty right? much I mean, from everybody. Most stuff it, pirated it, all that. M not most, all of it was. There was no, <laughs> uh, no alternate. I mean, we didn't even have copyright laws in place um, till, till mid 90s, about 95, 96. <laughs> so, uh, which is why that whole uh, Tetris debacle happened. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, we in the stores sometimes you would be able to uh, pick up maybe buy like a game for PC starting maybe like ninety two ninety three something like that, uh, but you know it would be just pirated discs as somebody took a dot matrix printer printed a fancy sort of label with an image and just slapped it on a floppy and then sold it to you. you know. Sold it. So they were so selling pirated games was common. Uh, it was very much so. And of course, oh, wow. by the time CDs rolled around, I mean, selling pirated everything. We had pirated games, pirated movies. We did not have anything really arrived in the country legally for quite oh, a while. So yeah, that's uh, it's a whole different world to, to, to some people. I would people. imagine. Yeah. You know, the, the piracy I can understand. Um, selling it, though, that's the part that... Uh, it takes a lot of balls, <laughs> it, but that was the only way. It was either that or, or nothing. You know, people, True. a lot of people profited uh, very much, obviously, by going the road, bringing in a bunch of movies, a bunch of VHS tapes, or a bunch of them. And they had like ah. a duplication, mini duplication factory set up in garages and basements and whatever, having like fifty VCRs going at the same time. So you know, it was Capital. it was far far from being a pristine copy. But yes, it was our our you know new newly discovered capitalism, basically. So I was going to say, yeah, capitalism. <laughs> at work somewhat you know <laughs> pretty much yes and that was I the only... service you paid me some money yep. capitalism okay. but as far as <laughs> games go it was a while before people figure out you could save you sort of you could uh sell games really it was movies and stuff music and stuff like that but for some reason for games uh it was mostly just people trading for for a very 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 long time yeah, uh, floppies. So a lot of floppies. A lot of uh, I, that's, uh, those are my memories. A lot of oh, a yeah, lot of swapping. bad sectors and the uh, uh, Norton Disc Doctor and uh, all that sort of <laughs> stuff that I have now forgotten and you know don't miss. But you know, True. it had a certain yeah. charm to it, I guess. I was uh, I was lucky enough to have a couple of friends with modems, and so that's how I ended up getting my uh, my share of games. Uh, and then later on, I actually ended up working for a software store. And uh, the software store had a policy that employees could take uh, things home and use them for a day or two and then bring them back. The idea was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, the idea was, uh, well, you get to learn the software better, and that way you can help the customers better. Okay, sure. But, of course, everybody was, like, great, taking only games and of copying course. them. So uh, you wonder where your suppliers were in the mid-'80s. It was probably Babbage's or Egghead Software or any of the other places that, uh, that sold software. <laughs> so a lot of games there. The uh, if the PC had never been cloned, I'm not entirely sure we would have have uh, we would even be having this conversation. The the PC was not cloned for two years, and uh, only after it was cloned did a lot of games finally start coming out. That's when P uh, it, when you could get a PC for uh, or a clone rather for half the cost or even less of the original IBM, and they started to get into more homes. Finally, there was a, a market for this kind of thing. Um, I was going to mention a couple of clones, but uh, they don't really have, they're not really notable, um, maybe except Compaq. I, I loved uh, the original Compaq because uh, not only was it a really good clone of the PC, but it was portable, at mm -hmm. least portable if you could lift 60 pounds. <laughs> uh, with a built in CRT monitor, it was hardly portable, but you, it was, though. I mean, you could move it around. It had. Uh, uh, composite CGA built into it, so if you wanted to hook it up to a television and not use that uh, tiny nine-inch monitor, you could. Not only that, but some games uh, used they they um, they had graphics modes that would take advantage of the fact that you were outputting CGA to a television, and they'd go into what was called composite color mode. Hmm. And so, even though the capabilities of CGA were the same. Uh, instead of four colors, you got 16 colors. And so some of the games looked really good as a result. In fact, Starflight, which I mentioned earlier, was mm -hmm. the first game I discovered that could do that. Um, and later on, as I collected more, I, I was able to find a couple more. Um, so the compact was cool. Uh, I remember the Panasonic Senior Partner, which was another clone and also a loggable. And that one was uh, that one had a built-in printer so it wasn't enough to just stuff a monitor in there they had to stuff a printer in there as well and that was incredibly heavy 
Um, <laughs> it used uh, it used fax paper, so um, all of your printouts uh, had rough, torn edges right. as you ripped the paper <laughs> off, and uh, of course faded in three days if you left it in light. Um, but that was about it. My first machine was uh, was a clone as well. My father worked for AT and T. And uh, AT and T decided they wanted to get into the market. the 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 PC wasn't just like IBM made it, and so we will all buy it. It was more like this is really powerful. It, it's a great mix of power and cost. Even though four thousand was a lot, it was still a hell of a lot cheaper than trying to bring something else home, or work at the office for twelve or sixteen hours a day. And so. Um, it was it sold crazy well. Like they thought they were going to sell maybe a hundred thousand over the life of the machine, and in the first six months, they sold over a million. So mass. I mean, it, it, I think immediately everyone started jumping on making clones. So my clone was uh, an AT and T sixty three hundred, which was a clone of the Olivetti M twenty four. Uh, I actually have a video on YouTube. If you search for AT and T sixty three hundred on YouTube, you'll probably find my video. And I'll it's, so I'll a, spare it's a great everybody. video. I, I've seen it. Oh, and, well, thank you. Yeah, everybody should uh, you know probably pause this unless you're like driving or something, and and uh, <laughs> should uh, look it up. Very informative. Uh, I well, thank I you have very much. never seen something like that, so that, that sort of is very fascinating to me. Some of the clones uh, tried to enhance in in a couple of ways, and so it's always interesting to learn how they differed from the uh, oh, from the original. It looked like a very nice machine, actually. I, I thought so. That was that that served me well for six six and a half years. Nice. So it was built pretty well. So thank you, Olivetti. Um, but yes, yeah, so roughly eighty five, all these clones were out, um, including the uh, IBM even had their own clone, and uh, Tandy had their theirs, and we can talk about that in a minute or two. But that's when you really started seeing a lot more games come out. I think it was roughly eighty four that you started seeing um, uh, more educational titles, for example. So people were finally, I mean, you know, you may be a businessman, but maybe you also have a family and you'd like to, you know, help them learn. You know, English or math or something. So, started to see educational titles in '83, '84, and then around '85, I would say, um, and I guess people could check this with numbers or not, and believe me or not, but it was it was '85 when I really saw the PC gaming market explode. Mm -hmm. There was Electronic Arts with their flat boxes. Uh, you know their rock star photographs and uh, porting every successful title to the PC that that they had. <clears throat> Uh, there was, um, I mean, other games. Of course, Sierra had a, a big hit by this time, and so they were starting to come out with games, um, and uh, and it just kind of steamrolled from there. So, so as soon as the clones finally uh, went into households, you finally started seeing a lot of games, and much less booters, <laughs> All right. because because the clones had 256k of RAM, or they had additional. Graphic, I mean, you know, they had either EGA or, or in Tandy's case, Tandy graphics, and so um, it wasn't. There wasn't. Uh, it was, and and finally, hard drives, and so it was less compelling to, and also harder work. It's hard work to create a, a bootable game because you have to essentially you have to know the system very intimately at a right. very low level. You have, to, you have to essentially write your own operating system, however small it is. So uh, when hard drives finally started to become popular around 85, 86, that's also when you saw the uh, booters thing drop off. Probably the clone that really pushed forward PC gaming the most was the Tandy 1000. Um, but to understand the Tandy 1000, we should probably spend 30 seconds describing uh, IBM's attempt at a home personal computer, the PC Junior. Mm -hmm. uh, the P the um, IBM themselves wanted to get in on clones, and they uh, wanted to. Actually, that's you know that's not entirely true. I shouldn't say clones. Um, in fact, actually, as far back as February of 1982, they recognized the need that. Um, the business personal computer was really popular, but we should come out with the home one as well because they, there was still this big market of home machines that they wanted to break into. The Apple II dominated them. Uh, other players like the Atari 8-bit series, the Commodore 64, etc. They're like, we want a piece of that market. So they started working on what would eventually become the IBM PC Junior. And it was a PC, but it was dumbed down in several ways. However, most important to gaming, it had better graphics and better sound built in. It had mm -hmm. the same sound as the BBC Micro, um, the TI-99-4A. It had a, like a three-voice 
sound chip that could do three voices at once plus a kind of a rudimentary noise channel. Not impressive, but certainly better than just a beeper. Yep. And, uh, and the built-in graphics were um, the same resolution, but you can now use all 16 text colors. So the PC Junior, unfortunately, was a huge flop, um, something I could talk about for an hour, but I'll spare you. Uh, an hour talk on the PC Junior, but the the main thing is that it led to the Tandy 1000. The Tandy 1000 was a clone of the PC Junior, and um, unlike the Junior, it didn't fail. The reason it didn't fail is because uh, in America at that time, uh, there were Radio Shack stores all over the place. There were Radio Shack stores in strip malls, in indoor malls, and when the Tandy, just just like for the TRS-80, the earlier line of computers made by Tandy, sold through Radio Shack, um, the Tandy 1000 was also sold in these things. So you couldn't go into a mall uh, anywhere without seeing a Radio Shack and without seeing a Tandy 1000 right in the front, running a game or having, more, more often than not, having kids playing a game on it. And uh, so it sold well. And also because you knew you could take it right back to that very same place to get support for it or to ask questions or anything like that. Remember, this is before the Internet. So if you didn't know somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody else who could help you with your problem, you were, you were out of luck unless oh, you went yes. to a dealer. <laughs> totally. So the Tandy 1000 was crazy successful. And uh, for two solid years... Uh, it, the, some games supported EGA, but a lot of games supported the Tandy 1000 graphics standard um, because I think there were more Tandy 1000s sold than there were clones with EGA. So m generally, whenever you saw a game that had EGA support, it generally had the Tandy the graphics Tandy support as well. As well. Totally. So um, that I, it's so it's kind of silly to, to point at this huge flop of a PC Junior as saying it had kind of advanced. The, the PC as a gaming platform, but I think you can actually say that. I mean, Sierra was hugely popular, and their stuff uh, supported the graphics and, and the, the sound. sound. That's exactly. one of my For... bigger memories, like the first exactly. time I heard the... Because, you know, I, I had a PC my whole life, so, uh, and you know, played early Sierra games with a PC speaker sound, which, you know, exactly. very, very limited. So when, when I eventually finally heard what it sounded like on Tansy, the same versions and everything, and mm -hmm. and like the multi-channel theme, the Space Quest theme came on. I was just blown away. I was just like, <laughs> I I had no idea it actually sounded like it, and it had the instruments and stuff. You know, it sounded so so different at the time. I was I was in the same boat. I, my first clone only had a beeper, and so when I so I played King's Quest, I played Space Quest. Uh, and some other games, and so I go over to a friend's house, and he's got a Tandy 1000, and he puts the game, and it's like, let's play, okay, fine. So we put in like King's Quest 2, and and it starts up with all this music. I'm like, what the, <laughs> you know? It's it's funny. This game, you think you know very intimately, right. that you've yep. played for 10 or 20 hours, and then you take it over to some machine. It's got what? It's got all this hidden stuff in it. Um, so I, I absolutely love that. Um, I, I actually got a little bit obsessed with it. I used to uh, trade games and, in some cases, money um, for to rent time on other people's machines uh, <laughs> that were either a Tandy 1000 or a PC Junior. The, the, the thing that sticks out in my mind, there was a, a new kid at school and he dropped that he had a PC Junior and I had been composing all these this music and music construction set, mm. and I really wanted to hear what it sounded like on a real three voice chip. So I quite literally bribed him. I'm like, "Hey, I'll copy ten games for you if I can come over and use your machine for an hour." And he's like, "Nah, eh, whatever." So that happened, and I went over there and I plugged in a tape recorder to his PC Junior, and I, I recorded all of my compositions <laughs> on his machine. Um, I have fond memories of that event, but I don't have fond memories of the result because what I didn't know is that the PC Junior had one less voice than the speaker mixing they were doing, so some of my stuff had notes cut off. Oh. And second of all, the the PC Junior stuff um, and the Tandy, they in music construction set raised everything an octave because the sound chip could not go as low as the speaker. Mm. So everything I composed now sounded like it was a cartoon or being played <laughs> by hamsters or something silly. <laughs> Oh, I think I still have that tape somewhere, but uh, I don't need it. I still have the software and the files, too. <laughs> that's neat. Crazy. That's 10 games is a pretty good deal for that guy. <laughs> Yo, totally. Well, and he, the thing is, he I don't even think he could care less. In fact, halfway through me doing this, he was got kind of bored. He's like, eh, I'm, I'm leaving. Just let yourself out when you're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I took an extra, like, 15 minutes after that. So, yeah, that was, that was it, pretty much. I... I Advent, I uh, uh, followed sound cards and sound standards very closely 
you know, I, I coveted an IBM Music Feature Card in 1986, or no, it couldn't be 86. In 1987, I went into a, um, a, compu- oh, a computer, I want to say computer shopper, but that's not correct. That's the name of a magazine. I went into um, a, a, a common business retail chain in the USA, uh, mostly geared toward selling business computers. And they had um, a PS2 Model 30 there with an IBM Music Feature Card in it. And I couldn't, I can't remember what blew me away more, whether it was the 256 color graphics I was now seeing or the Music Feature Card. They had it on a demo and it was playing uh, pre recorded MIDI music and things like that. So this was before AdLib. Right. This is before anything. And um, I. I went bonkers, and I never, for, I never forgot that, and always tried to find that. But the cost of the card was seven hundred dollars. This is typical IBM, charging way too much for something. Um, so I didn't actually get a music feature card until uh, much later, like ninety nine. But uh, now I have three. I think I have the world's largest collection of music <laughs> feature cards, which is pretty sad. But like I said, we can talk about sound some other time. But. Uh, yeah, the, you can thank uh, the Tanyuan Thousand for uh, probably playing uh, Saints Row 4 <laughs> on your PC. A long, strange trip. Yeah, isn't it? That's yeah. weird. Some, um, I'm, see, that's where I fail a little bit uh, uh, since I've never actually, uh, haven't seen a tan until years later after, you know, it was actually, uh, you know, around. Uh, well, it's much easier to emulate them than it is to find them. Uh, I guess anything that was uh, like Tandy specific besides, because I know a whole bunch of games that obviously supported Tandy and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, like the, uh, and, you know, uh, I know some versions of course are a lot better because they take advantage of those features, but were there any like Tandy exclusives that never made it anywhere else? You bring up a good point. There's, there were in this, in the one year, Roughly, when people were still making bootable games and this Tandy 1000 thing became popular and the PC Junior was announced, um, there were a couple of games that added uh, sound and graphics support specifically for, the, for, for that standard. You know, the, the games that definitely didn't make it anywhere else have a very good reason. They were programmed for the PC Junior and they're on cartridges. Oh. So you have games like um, Activision ported Pitfall 2 and River Raid and uh, Imagic ported uh, Demon Attack and Microsurgeon and uh, those were PC Junior exclusives uh, on cartridges. Now I work with a couple of preservation groups and we've already dumped the ROMs and you can already play them, most of them in uh, DOSBox already. Um, but uh, it would be difficult to get them to run on anything else including Tandy because uh, although Tandy copied the capabilities, uh, the graphics capabilities and the sound, they kind of enhanced it a little bit and changed it a little bit. Mm-hmm. So the older games on cartridge, they interact, they, they boot, right? There's right. no DOS, there's no right. nothing. So they interact with the hardware at its absolute lowest level and sometimes that does not work on a Tandy. You know, it's funny. Actually, there's some Tandy 1000 games that, even though they use the same graphics and sound, don't work on a PC Junior because Tandy changed the size of the graphics memory window. And uh, most Tandy games, um, I shouldn't say most, but I'd say at least half of them uh, use that expanded window. And when you try to run it on a Junior, you can, but every third and fourth line is black. Mm. So, wow. <laughs> so you have you have line, line, black, black, right. line, line, black, black. So you can play the game, but it, it's not pleasant. Hmm. Um, I would say exclusives. The only one I can really think of is Touchdown Football. I hear rumor that there was that it was ported to something other than Tandy Graphics and Sound, um, but I've never seen it. Um, uh, that was ported uh, by Imagic and. Uh, it's notable in that when you start it up, it talks. It was the it was pretty amazing actually. So for 1984, you I mean I know there were other games that talked as well, um, but this one really talked. It it used the sound chip specifically. It, it um, I don't know if this is too technical for your users, but uh, the guy who programmed it had sampled his voice. Um, I don't know what what hardware he used, but he converted it into um, a four bit format. So 4-bit is 16 volume levels, mm-hmm. and it just so happens that the PC Junior and the Tandy Sound Chip have 16 levels 
of uh, volume that you can do. So you can trick the sound chip into producing level output, and then you just simply manipulate the volume as fast as you can, and those volume levels become your sound output. So Touchdown Football had speech for the introduction, the start of the game, the halftime, calling fouls, things like that. It wasn't a bunch of speech, wow. but it sounded really good. It sounded better than, say, Wolfenstein did. Right. Wolfenstein tried to pulse the speaker um, and I think it used like a one-bit method or something. Yeah, it, wasn't, it really wasn't that good. It wasn't great. Like Beyond, Beyond Castle Wolfenstein sounds really good. Uh, True. It, uh, I think they went with a better method there. But uh, yeah, so I'm trying to think. Touchdown football. Um, there, there are a couple of... Well, so King's Quest, when it came out, was originally for the PC Junior. Mm -hmm. And then later they wrote their system for the PC and enhanced it slightly for the Tandy 1000 and also the Apple IIe and the Atari and the Amiga, etc. And so their interpreter was the same, so it could run this, the game nearly identically on all those. Right. But the very first version, the PC Junior version, was so junior specific, there are some things in it that are not in any other version of King's Quest, including the booter PC and the booter Tandy 1001. Really? Um, yeah, the PC Junior King's Quest, when it starts up, uh, draws the Sierra logo, and it doesn't have green sleeves as its opening theme, it just has like, a, like an announcement, like a trumpeted announcement. And then while you're playing, there's constant little sounds of like birds and crickets, wow. things like that. So um, hopefully there's got to be a, a video on YouTube of that. If not, uh, maybe I'll set up a camera and, and do mine. That's very interesting. I did not know that at all. No, no. There you go. I've, value has been added to your <laughs> podcast. <laughs> uh, classic PC gaming trivia. There you go. Um, but other than those two, there are probably more, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, there were certainly, I mean, the, the great majority of them were games that had, they didn't advertise PC Junior support or Tandy 1000 support, but it was embedded in there. Mm -hmm. When when people knew, the, the PC Junior was leaked really early. It was this uh, uh, this horrible, not well-kept secret at all. It was, in fact, some some people have said they leaked that they were working on it intentionally to hurt other competitors but that's the that's the tinfoil hat conspiracy theory i don't think i don't think that's correct but a lot of people thought that because the pc had sold so well that the pc junior was also going to sell really well so there are a lot of games that have hidden uh stuff in them like um i want to say um rendezvous with rama is a tellarium text adventure with graphics and if you start it up on a PC Junior, and I think also a Tandy 1000. Like, it doesn't say this anywhere on the box. Um, if you start it up, just three voice music starts playing in a couple of places. Wow. So it's like, oh, that's kind of nice. So they, nice. they stuck it in there. Um, Agent USA was the same was the same way. There were a lot of games that said compatible with PC and PC Junior, but that didn't mean the same as we support PC Junior graphics and right, sound. Right. So it was always this pleasant surprise when you booted something up and got it. Um, I think Seven Cities of Gold from Electronic Arts was another one. It, it just simply said compatible with, and it would list all these machines. But then you booted it on a Tandy 1000, and suddenly you got this nice sound and this nice graphics. So was, those, those hidden things are always fun to come across. Wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. But no, not exclusives. I think only the cartridge games, you could consider those the, uh, the exclusives. Those, those, by the way, the ones I mentioned were the good ones. Those are the ones that are worth tracking down and actually playing because they're, they're identical to whatever you remember on an Atari 2600 or, or whatever. Hmm. There were a couple of other cartridge games that were brand new, created for the system. Um, they're not very good. <laughs> so they're not worth, I mean, like Minecart is not very good and Mouser is pretty terrible and um, Mouser's just a clone of um, uh, a Pac-Man type clone arcade game and then there was another one that's a total ripoff of River Raid so you might as well just get River Raid <laughs> yeah. so not worth, not worth tracking down having a, a slow machine meant that the, the really great games the, the ones that were really well programmed stood out one of my favorite is, is Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's not. Really that's a that's a great one. The good game example. I huh? could never. A game I could never play, obviously, as a, as a kid, because uh, well, remember, remember, it's it's technically a simulation. I mean, yes. there there actually is a World War One biplane fighting simulation in it, and it keeps score, but it's it's hardly a <laughs> a game. Just the just the mere fact of booting it up and and getting, you know, more than one frame a second in full three D 
on an old machine is pretty no, damn impressive. No, it was all fascinating. In fact, back in the day, uh, most, like, I guess most uh, technically impressive games all were simulators, uh, as far as for, I recall. For the, well, f many of them were. Um, I was going to throw out a couple of titles like Indy 500, yes. which is uh, 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 utterly amazing. It is. Uh, yeah. It looks so good. Like, to this day, that game looks amazing. And to it me, does. I never liked racing games, and especially didn't like racing games that are like serious simulators, but that was one of, the, I think, one of the first games uh, that there, there was a racing game that I played on PC was um, uh, Grand Prix Circuit. Uh, oh, very the nice game too. Accolade, a, but it was like was a very Jeff Crammond, I think. Yeah. Very. Oh no, 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 Grand Prix Circuit. No, not, you're right. I remember. Yeah, not the not the one from the '90s. The the one from like '88. The I '80s. Yeah. Yes. So that was, that was like a very very basic thing that really made you. I mean, it's a neat game for what it was, but like, uh, it it really made you hate the the PC speaker engine sound and all that stuff. <laughs> like, I will never forget those those the horrible noises and. Indy, Indy 500 came right after that. Like, they were so close together. And what a giant leap that was. It was. Absolutely. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I, I used to play... You said you, you hate racing games and simulators. Um, I love racing games. Not a great fan of racing simulators. But I would start Indy 500 just so I could drive backwards on the track and try to take out as many <laughs> yes, people as I absolutely. Could. <laughs> it's like the same thing I play uh, when, when Papyrus's uh, NASCAR racing came around. That's all I ever did. <laughs> just turn around. There you go. And it's... I'd, w I'd win by default. There were no cars left. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like, it was like no Indy 500 is a is a really good looking game. If anybody is for whatever reason, I mean, it is old and is not familiar uh, with Indianapolis 500. Look it up. It's uh, it's uh, and look up a video if you can because that game looks good. And keep in mind how old that game is. Yeah, at 1980, it was 1989 when that thing was programmed, and you could, it plays just as well as any modern game does, except the fact that the graphics look, you know, obviously dated. It the the game plays so well that it almost comes off as like a retro modern flash game trying to be mm -hmm. all retro or something like yes. that. But that's how good this game plays Absolutely. back then and now. And I mean, the graphics are amazing and fast. Uh, yes, that game was Absolutely. liking fast. And the way it did, like it looked like there were, you know, like the color pixels on the side looked like an audience and everything. And yeah. you know, the, <laughs> the, 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 it held filled polygons and trees. And and it was also a serious simulator. I mean, you can customize yeah. just about every aspect of your car. And it was really difficult too to play properly, yeah, which it, I it, never did. But you know, I never won. Legit Legitimately. Yeah. I only won on the 10 lap round where, like I said, you could smash into cars with no penalty. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty much the only time I won. You know, it's funny. I, I used to I, I idolize that game then and now, and it was only last year that I finally tracked down uh, some information about how it was programmed. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 100% uh, assembler, wow. which is uncommon. For 1989, that's uncommon. Normally, you would program your game in in C mm -hmm. and you would uh, if it wasn't fast enough maybe you'd write parts of it in assembler or use uh, an, an assembler library but it, that really was program 100% in assembler and uh, David Kemmer uh, the programmer um, he did try to simulate some physics in it so there's actually a little bit of physics but the, the thing I found interesting is that he his ambitions were that game but it had his target was actually an eight megahertz machine. It does run on a four megahertz machine. It's roughly two and a half frames a second. It's that's still amazing. Mm -hmm. But if you have anything other than the original PC, that's when it actually really starts to shine. That was his target. So he did um, something that uh, I don't think people started doing commonplace for three or four years later. Uh, he had an early version of I guess it would be um, polygon tessellation, which is you so you draw uh, level of detail. Um, yeah, level of detail. You draw rough polygons in the background, and then you draw finer stuff up front. Mm. So he did kind of like um, you can see the car. If you look very carefully, you can see the cars snap between a more detailed model when they're close to you and a, and a very basic model when they're very far away from you. His he found that uh, the frame rate he enjoyed was um, best achieved if he drew 30 or less polygons. So the game, as it's running, is constantly adjusting itself to display 30 polygons, either you know rough ones or fine ones or whatever. And that's why you can also see in the graphics detail setup an auto setting. And as you play, sometimes you'll see clouds pop in, or then you'll see them turn off when you're in a stadium and it has to draw more of the stadium. Mm -hmm. 
It's a, that's amazing. It the is. fact that he had level of detail in a 1989 game, I never heard of that. And so that game was well ahead of its time. Yeah, and it's it holds up still. Like that's one of those games where yeah. if you're into those kind of games, you can just pick it up and you know it, it will stand out, stand the test of time, even graphically, because it still looks. It just looks yeah. very basic, but there's nothing really particularly that you know that that really dates it that much in it somehow it manages to look with it like solid graphics and everything you know like the polygons look good and everything the colors that that they're picked are are really nicely fit together so there's really nothing yeah. that you look at it and you're like oh, oh yeah yeah there's no gl- there's no glitches there's no overdraw he didn't he f- the polygons fit together correctly i mean he really did it correctly the uh and you a lot of people might miss the fact that it's also fantastic in the sound department the music and sound were done by rob hubbard oh wow. so uh, uh, Ad lib specifically um, is the be- is the best card I would recommend when you're actually driving because uh, he really programs the thing to sound just like I mean the cars sound fantastic. Oh, I should try that. I only play that, that game ever on the PC speaker. So oh yeah, no, definitely throw it in DOSBox and and do Ad lib and uh, it's. It's astonishing how good that thing is. You're listening to the Indy 500 show here on the DOS <laughs> Nostalgia Podcast. <laughs> it's uh, it's great. So you're, I mean, you're right. A lot of the going back to your other point, a lot of the games uh, that were technically impressive were simulators. Um, there are a couple that weren't necessarily simulators. Uh, I'm hopefully everybody's familiar with Digger. Yes, uh, of yeah, course. Yeah, love everyone loves that game. Everybody Easily. loves popcorn too. It's popcorn. Like, <laughs> yes. To me, the two are indistinguishable. And I bet for quite a few people uh, who grew up with Digger, uh, it, they sort of you know as soon as they see like a screenshot of Digger or something, this popcorn just starts playing in their head. Yes, because that's that the reaction the that I, I have. Heard, first time I heard that tune, and uh, you know, imagine my surprise when I heard the original. And I scrambled to like what the someone copied the music of Digger, and then I look at the date <laughs> on right. the on the song, and it's 1969. I'm like, whoa! So another mind blowing moment brought to you by computer gaming. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, Digger was well programmed. Not it, when you look at it, it doesn't look like it because it's just got a couple of sprites and a, you know. Um, w- the reason I feel Digger is a is a, an exceptionally programmed game is because uh, the sound is going on constantly in the background. And the programmer, if you go to um, Digger.org, which is the home of Digger Remastered by Andrew Jenner, where he took the original code and he reverse engineered it and made it into C and Java and and stuff like that. Um, there's uh, an interview. I think he posted an interview. Um, he he met, after like 25 years. He tracked down the guy who wrote it, and uh, in that interview, the guy said that he um, was very proud of the sound engine. He spent a lot of time tweaking how much of the CPU it could take up and not affect gameplay while still sounding good. Wow! So it's not just that you have. I mean, when you when you grab the power pellet. Well, actually, not the power pellet. When you when the screen is flashing and you're hearing just the beep, the PC beeper right. sounds, that doesn't take up any sound. But when you're playing the game and the background music, the popcorn is going. If you listen to it, it doesn't sound like a beep. It sounds like a little phased, like a phaser sound. Right. And that's because he's pulsing the speaker at like a thousand times a second. Right. So um, that's also why Digger is a hair slow um, on an original machine. But it, um, you know, it that was pretty. That was quite a technique to have. Um, you know, you're bit banging on the speaker for for nice sounding music at the same time the game is going. So uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, kudos to him. I mean, like, uh, I mean, as nice of a game it is, uh, it's just a clone of, I, don't know, I guess, like a mix between the Dig Dug and uh, uh, what else am I thinking of? Uh, uh, Mr. Do. Mr. Do. That's right. And, yes. Uh, uh, but like everybody remembers Digger for for the sound. Yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, another game everybody remembers for the sound uh, and that I also feel was exceptionally programmed because of it is Mean Streets. Oh, of course. Uh, are you a Tex Murphy fan oh, at all? Of course I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> I find it funny that th- there are all these innovations in Mean Streets, like um, all the graphics are 256 color mm-hmm. and they're dithered real time for the, for the graphic standard you actually have. Mm-hmm. And that's the game. It wasn't the first game that had real sound, but it was the game that made their real sound process uh, popular. And uh, it had that flight sim. I find it funny that originally Mean Streets was just going to be a flight sim. Like what they were really starting, uh, to, they, what they were trying to do was make a sequel to Echelon, mm-hmm. which didn't do so well. And Echelon was just that, a flight simulator. And then they thought, well, let's try to build this adventure stuff around it. And thankfully, someone had the bright idea to build a lot more adventure <laughs> around it because the flight sim part, 
is uh, nobody. I mean, every I just put it on autopilot. That's what everybody like, does, anybody, doesn't it? Like everybody it's, puts it on it's, autopilot. It's weird. Like it's almost weird to always remember that it actually allows you f- for manual controls and has all those, you know, uh, the little three D models to, to fly around the, oh, the, yeah. the bridge and everything. Pitch it's very bank. detailed, but you never really use it. You just punch up the coordinates and well, there's no there's no point. The funny thing is, like you know, Mean Streets is. Primarily, now it is anyway, primarily an adventure game. So you're like, what the hell is a simulator doing in here? And why do I, like, you didn't fight people in it. You didn't discover new clues with it. So what was the point? And it, I, I guess eventually they realized, yeah, what is the point? So thankfully they put the uh, the auto nav in there and now you don't even have to fly the simulator. No, it's absolutely, it's it, it's great. I love that game. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I replayed it last year, but I, you know, I, I probably have fonder memories of, of it than... As a game, of course, it's far from perfect, but it just just as every access game early on combines so many like innovative uh, elements together somehow. They just I mean they might not always work perfectly together, but it was always technologically impressive. Yeah, and I felt that they I actually liked uh, Mean Streets because I thought they nailed the the cyberpunk uh, bl- you know detective noir melding pretty good like you know like a future noir story and i like that and it's i think that uh is the best in under a killing moon but uh yes again we're talking talking about it we could talk about that for an hour <laughs> but uh again this is trying to focus on the first decade of the pc here so i won't go into that um there were games that had really good sound through the speaker before then but not certainly not as much as mean streets mm-hmm. um another one that that stands out in my mind is metropolis which yes. actually i mentioned that before as a booter um, that did not do well in America. I don't know if it did well anywhere else. It uh, was programmed by Graham Devine. Uh, I don't know if that name means anything, but uh, Graham of Devine it was. Does. The... Okay, so I hope seventh people, guest... people who are listening to this actually know who those people are. Uh, yeah, I, I really do, and if they don't, they should really, you know, uh, look them up. Track them down. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, especially now so, with all those wonderful resources available. That's true. Well, so I've already mentioned Seventh Guest and Eleventh Hour. He obviously programmed those, but um, before then, uh, he did uh, two, at least two games for the PC. I don't know if he did. You know, I think he did a third one. I want to say that he did Cool Spot for the PC, but I could be wrong about that. Cool Spot was this Seven Up mm-hmm. promotion game. I remember that. It was that a as combination well. of yeah, it was that game uh, Attacks or something like that. I'm trying to remember what the real name of that is, but um, but Turbo and Metropolis were were very well programmed. Metropolis was this two disc booter game. Um, so it booted. It had hidden. I wouldn't say hidden, but it had support for Tandy hmm. uh, graphics. So that was a nice surprise. Interesting. And uh, it, uh, all of the robots and most of the clues that you got from the robots. It, you're the only. The, the premise of the story is that you're the only human in a in a world uh, full of, or at least in this game, in a city full of robots, and all the humans are gone. And uh, you have to interview robots and uh, get clues and stuff. There are occasional news broadcasts. And all of the speech that the robots produce is spoken through the PC speaker mm-hmm. uh, through a very poor <laughs> speech te- synthesis. text speech synthesizer. <laughs> but, but, it, but it was a novelty. It, it was works. A I was just it playing worked. that like well, a few weeks it worked, ago. <laughs> it worked, but let's just say, thank goodness uh, that the text of what they're saying is also put on the screen. Because boy, <laughs> yeah. you sure need it. If, if you had to solve the game by the PC speaker, it would remain unsolvent to this day. Um, but and and then also slightly after Metropolis, he did uh, Turbo. Turbo was a game, was a budget game for, I think it was either Mastertronic or Thunder Mountain. It was one of those budget publishers, and uh, they actually, I think he told me um, over email about ten years ago that I don't think he ever got paid for Turbo, <laughs> so they ended up publishing the last version he sent them. Um, which, so that's why if you find Turbo and run it, you're like, what the hell is this crap? But if you just start it and let it go, what you can see is an amazing racing engine in there. It has scaled sprites, and the frame rate is above 5 frames per second on a 4 megahertz machine. Wow. And on any other machine, it's it's very fluid. So while other games like um, like OutRun, like games that had scaled sprites in the air, arcade but just simply had mip mapped you know different versions different sizes of sprites on the PC like outrun or something um, this game had real scaled sprites real time so that one's pretty that was that was pretty damn amazing to look at 
And uh, I asked him for the code, and he said, uh, "I love that code, but I lost it, so he doesn't have the uh, <laughs> oh. doesn't have the turbo code anymore." So uh, some early successes from Graham Devine. The game itself is is not is horrible. There's no acceleration. All you can do is turn left and right, <laughs> and when you turn, um, the game slows down. So I guess that's your break. And uh, a lot of the graphics were ripped from other uh, games, and <laughs> it's, it's 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 definitely unfinished. But it's it's floating out there in the wild, so you can definitely throw it in. If you throw it in DOSBox, throw the cycles down to like 300, and then see how good it still runs. Hmm. Like that's that's what I love about uh, Turbo. And uh, you know, past that, there weren't a lot of people. I mean, once you hit 1989, I guess you know, game makers started finally leaving the original PC behind. Um, a couple, I think the last game to really support the PC well was actually the Shareware uh, Commander Keen series, like four through six. One through three were famous uh, by using some EGA hardware tricks to have a really smooth scrolling background. So mm -hmm. everyone remembers those Commander Keens. Of I don't think a lot of people remember the four through six, the ones where it's. Um, it's side scrolling as well, but it's got kind of a slightly isometric perspective to the to the levels. You know what I mean? Yeah, Have you seen of the course later ones? Yeah, yeah. I... So the the later ones had a CGA version. That, and that's that I never knew. Like that, I, oh. I'm actually I'm actually well, I, maybe I've seen the menu selection, but I obviously they no. came so late that I have never seen anybody or never tried playing it in CGA. So this is very interesting. So so what Carmack did was he completely rewrote the engine, and the way he wrote the engine made it compatible with CGA because it was based on on more intelligent tiling. The the original Commander Keen. Um, it was, you know, you gotta love marketing. It it did to Carmax credit. It did use some EGA hardware to have a very smooth scrolling screen. But as uh, I, I got the straight dope from Romero about, I want to say five or six years ago, um, he was using some things like horizontal panning registers and things like that. But he was mainly doing a lot of redundant work. He was copying the screen almost every single update. He was just simply doing it very fast um, using EGA latches and things like that. Now maybe I misunderstood Romero but I, um, I'm pretty sure I didn't. But with Commander Keen 4 through 6, Carmack rewrote the engine so that the only things that updated uh, were anything new like a new edge scrolling on the screen or a sprite moving around. Right. So that was that updated as little memory as possible so you could just slide the EGA hardware window around and you could still maintain that really fast frame rate and because he wrote it that way if you faked a, 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 a scroll I'm trying to keep it I don't want to get too technical but I'm trying to keep it understandable if you if you want to fake a window update all you have to do is just copy all of the RAM directly to CGA RAM um, and you don't have to change the main style of the engine at all. So while the Commander Keen 1 through 3 engine were very specific to EGA, in fact they were so specific they actually had problems with some EGA compatible cards, 4 through 6 are written more generically. So there's a Commander Keen 4 through 6 for CGA and the reason you haven't seen them is because it wasn't a menu selection you had to download a specific CGA version, executable. Oh. So the Commander Keen 4 shareware CGA is floating out there and fairly easy to find. Wow. Uh, um, there's no reason for you to check it out. I'm just mentioning <laughs> it for <laughs> I'm mentioning it for I mean I'm mentioning all of these uh, actually for the benefit of people who who are into vintage computing and have 4 megahertz 8088s or 7 megahertz 8088s and CGA and they want to try to run something that that actually makes their machine feel just a hair better than than a lot of the slow stuff they're probably used to seeing on it. Um, so that's about it for, for programming prowess. There are a couple of games that did very interesting CGA hardware tweaks. Um, and I consider those well programmed. I don't know if a lot of other people do. Because they, they made the graphics better on a stock CGA, but then they broke compatibility with things like VGA and stuff. Hmm. Um, uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with California games. Mm -hmm. Uh, California Games is 16 colors on EGA and Tandy and composite color output on the CGA. Mm -hmm. But they also figured out that it took very few instructions to change the color palette. You know you know how CGA has like four, four. really ugly colors yep. that you can choose from and there's only like three sets of those ugly colors? Yep. You can change that palette very fast, so fast in fact, that you can change it while 
like the beam is drawing mm -hmm. horizontally across and then you can switch it as the beam is retracing to draw the next line so they wrote uh, if you look at the graphics selection in California games there's CGA four color mode and then right under it they have sheepishly CGA more color mode and if you have if you have a true four megahertz 8088 and I th and um, it worked on some clones I don't think it worked on the Tandy 1000 there there's um uh, I mentioned Andrew Jenner before the the guy who did Digger Remastered he he reverse engineered the program and figured out why it was touchy um, because he was trying to get it to work correctly this more color mode in mess and I don't know if he's completed that work yet or not but on the original PC and extremely close compatibles it would change that palette once or even twice while the screen was still being drawn so the top half of the screen will have like the red yellow green palette right. and then in an area of the screen where red is the common color like red and black mm -hmm. are the common colors it switches it and then from that point on it's red cyan magenta and black and then at the bottom to display the high scores it switches back to that red green yellow one so you've got six or seven colors on the screen at at, at one time and it used uh, it, it took over the the timer interrupt to have it you know fire off that code at exactly the, the scan line that it wanted very clever wow. um, so I, there are a few games that do that, um, but California Games really shows it off. I think the only other games I can think of that do that are Sierra's Frogger, the original Frogger, not Frogger 2, mm -hmm. and um, Jungle Hunt, the Atari Soft Jungle Hunt game. But uh, pretty amazing stuff uh, when you think about it. Um, probably the only thing more amazing than that that I can remember are games that invented new video modes. <laughs> um, so there was one company that uh, called uh, Macrocom, and they came out with a game called Icon Quest for the Ring. And then later on, they marketed uh, a, a follow-up to that game, uh, Seven Spirits of Ra, uh, through Surtech. But the original, but both those games, and, and specifically the first one, Icon Quest for the Ring, um, the you've you've heard of uh, Anzi Art, I'm sure. Uh -huh. Anyone who's anyone who's been on a BBS and downloaded a pirated game has seen Anzi Art, whether they logged into the BBS and saw it scrolling by or in a crack screen or whatever. Um, the guy who programmed Icon felt that if there was some way he could get better control over the characters, mm -hmm. he could create even better Anzi Art. It, it wasn't called Anzi Art when he programmed it. This was like eighty four, eighty five, and he discovered that you can uh, alter the uh, graphics controller chip on CGA to instead of drawing so text characters have eight lines in them right. you know one two three four five six seven eight and then the next row begins and you're in one two three four five six seven eight he found that you can change that number and it would display not all eight lines of a character but only the first two and then it would immediately start on the next line and only display the first two lines and then start on the next line etc so only the top two lines of each character were being displayed. That's the mode that Icon, Quest for the Ring, and Seven Spirits of Ra are programmed in. And that's crazy, <laughs> but because, I mean, can you imagine trying to draw a graph? And there's no graphics course, editor for right, that. Right. You, had to, you have, to, have to do it on yeah. graph paper or yep. something. Um, and in fact, uh, in fact, he did. I interviewed him and uh, the designer of both of those games for a, a Moby Games feature article, gosh, a decade ago. Um, it's been a long time. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the whole game is in that kind of broken, wacky text mode. And uh, so you saw it, what the effective resolution was roughly 320 by 200 by 16, same as Tandy. But this was before Tandy existed. Um, and it was also you couldn't individually address each dot. Of course, right. you were drawing with you were drawing with chopped off text characters, and that's if that sounds bonkers, it's because it is. But some of the stuff looks really good. He even managed to um, create kind of a gothic scripty font using <laughs> chopped off characters in the in the standard eight by eight font. So that's nuts, but that's dedication. So um, I think those games run correctly on DOSBox. I'm not sure. I know that other games that use that technique, like Round 42, which I think you are familiar with, um, that's a shooting game. Um, I think DOSBox was altered 
to work with those, but I'm not sure if they work with Icon or with Seven Spirits of Rob. Uh, they might. If they do. I think I've seen a video of uh, of Icon on, on, on YouTube somewhere. So, and I I sincerely doubt that somebody actually captured it from a real machine. I mean, they might have, but uh, well, it would be tough because um, in this mode, composite color output on the on the on the jack on the back of the CGA card, it doesn't work right. Right. Um, so if they if there was live video, it would have to be shot directly of an RGB monitor. So uh, hopefully there is. Uh, if not, maybe uh, some kind soul listening to this will be willing to capture some and throw it up on YouTube. I would, but uh, I'm 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 too busy. <laughs> I'm working on uh, many other vintage projects right now and uh, couldn't do that at the moment. So yeah, there's uh, well-programmed games. Um, a couple of others, if you, can, if you can track them down. Interphase is this wonderful. It's probably the best 3D code I've ever seen, and uh, Vaccine. Uh, looks like it's 3D code, but it's not. That scene looks pretty awesome, actually. It, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. It looks like Ball Blazer. It's got this, uh, you know, this checkerboard. It's really that's fluid. And yeah, of course, yes. it's obviously all tricks because, you know, you have the checkerboard and you have the spheres, basically, yes. and stuff. But it looks really neat in motion and scrolling. And it also has the uh, the um, the text messages that 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 pop up and stay in a 3D space all very very uh, That's true. effective like really neat visual tricks very very it's one of my favorite uh, companies that made games for the PC they um, called the assembly line and so you can guess what they programmed in as well um, yeah vaccines great and actually on top of all of that. Uh, sound effects are through the PC speaker and they're in the background so the machine does not lock up to play the sound effects mm -hmm. um, unfortunately the sound effects are suffer a bit in terms of quality but just you know it's what's that saying um, it's not how well the bear dances it's that the bear is dancing at all <laughs> so that's that's how I view almost all of this stuff I mean of course it it's not as amazing on other platforms but the fact that it's happening at all is a real testament to the programmers skill knowledge of the machine and creativity um, you have to pull off some pretty creative stuff sometimes to try to you know merge all of this stuff happening together all at once and so uh, right. vaccines a good good indication of that so, well-programmed games for your vintage machine. How about that? No, it was very good. And, you know, a lot of those games are, you know, some of them are, most of them aren't just interesting for their technical achievements. Uh, it was back in those days where, you know, like limitations truly breed creativity often. So, uh, you know... That's an excellent point. Not, not a lot of people remember that. Sometime, some people like to say, games were better back in the old days, and they, it's, it's just a nostalgia rose-colored glasses, crotchety old man kind of a thing, but sometimes they really were better back in the old days, precisely of what you mentioned, because you didn't have flashy graphics and sound, so the gameplay had to be solid. That's what uh, I feel like. I'm Okay, this is going to be one of those derailments, but like I barely play games now, even though they look great and everything, and they're expensive and flashy, and... But I feel that we're sort of stuck in that time where not a lot of innovation, like games barely, you know, I, I still play games, but they rarely grab me uh, to, to the point where when I put, in, put them down, I never really come back. Uh, but I tend to come back to quite a lot of old games. And yes, there's, you know, I am, you know, DOS nostalgic for a reason. A lot of times I'll just play a game and like, like last year I had to replay, you know, I pulled up a whole bunch of games from 1992 to revisit them. Mm -hmm. And playing a lot of them, I was just like, well, I'd never play that now. I didn't have no patience, nor, there, nor were they good games, but I played a lot of them back in the day. But some of the games still really impress me a lot. I keep coming back, of course, to I play old games often uh, because because they're good games because they would be they still would be good games today with the same you know uh, same concepts would work really really well because they're creatively made games that uh, use the limitations of the platform to, to their advantage of uh, you know in a, in a way I guess uh, no I, I completely agree I think that um, you you also had a lot more risk taking back then mm -hmm. so I can think of games like Weird Dreams where you're of stuck course. in somebody's oh. dream. I can think of Metropolis where you're the only human in a in a place full of robots. Um, and, you com and you communicate with uh, with questions. With questions, that's right, a exactly. really weird system. More like, tell me about the tape. 
tell me exactly. about this. Tell me about this. Tell me about <laughs> yeah. that. Um, you had things, I mean, without the early days where it was sort of a no man's land, you wouldn't have games like Mule, well known as one of probably the, probably the best four player computer game ever made, strategy computer game ever made. Um, so simple and yet incredibly complex. And uh, unfortunately, we are stuck today, the world of, of PC and console gaming is that. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a there's a lot of innovation of happening, and, and there's a lot of there are a lot of fantastic games to play. And of but course, for- it takes a lot of effort to make those kind of big it, big games, absolutely. huge teams, and there's a lot of artistry and, oh, yeah. and, no, and everything not, that goes into it. So of course, I, I yeah, I'm not downing new games at all. Um, but I the comment I wanted to make was that we are sort of stuck in not a rut but we're stuck in kind of a weird place with with modern gaming um yes. ever for, for the last five years because publishers are i mean it takes a lot of money to yeah. make a, a, a top, shot, top shelf game so publishers are very skittish and unwilling to try to do things that are too derivative they know that the next call of duty will sell so call of duty gets most of the money they know that the next saints row or grand GTA, theft auto is gonna sell. that's right GTA. so you can't you can't go too outside of the box. On the other hand, there's a wonderful, thriving indie community. I, the last six years have seen this, this explosion, explosion of indie stuff, which I absolutely love. It reminds me of the early days, but unfortunately for them, because they are indie, they don't have big publishers. It's one or two guys. Maybe they chose to program it in Flash, which is only going to work on a Windows machine or whatever. They don't have the exposure. So mm-hmm. you've got the big guys with mostly derivative games with the exposure and then you've got the really unique stuff um, you know under the what's the metaphor I'm looking for here you know kind of like under the radar right but um, you know there's so, nobody knows about and of course, so yeah, they, they hurt with distribution and especially on something like the mobile platforms and stuff you know half that yeah. stuff goes completely unnoticed or, yeah. or something like. but yeah of course in the, in the things in the last few years raised some some things that uh, that are completely incredible and uh, yeah. you know, that, uh, that's a good thing there's an early interview i think 81 with uh, ken williams and uh, of of sierra and he's saying that in the early days there was so little competition that everybody was friendly and they would go on they would have like a uh, every, he'd invite them over to where they were in in um Colorado and they'd, they'd go river rafting all together like all the different competitors and game makers and stuff uh, and then you know by the time he left Sierra in 95 um, if you got 1% market share you were considered a huge huge success so it's not necessarily that there aren't quality indie games out there or anything like that it's just that the market is so incredibly saturated mm-hmm. there's too there's too many I, I love checking out new indie games but there's too many indie games it's like I can't I can't even check out all of them and some of them are for only one platform and and if I don't have that platform in front of me I'll never find them Mm -hmm. and so you know it's it's I, I like new concepts. Like you know, in the old days, you had unique concepts and a limited a limited audience. Mm-hmm. You had personal computers, and that was pretty much it. You know, no one was trying to develop, or, or maybe arcades too. But it was if it wasn't consoles or computers or arcades, um, it well, I mean, there wasn't anything past that. I don't know what my point is. I guess my point is, you have lots of wacky ideas, and you've got three platform classes, and now you have six or seven platform classes: mobile, tablets, web. Etc. So it's the market is saturated. It's it's very tough to find stuff, and I think that's why people well, people go back to some nostalgic uh, old games because that's where they can find some of the wacky concepts. Purple Saturn Day, where you're playing uh, sports games on an alien world, right. or um, you know, gosh, I, it's probably a lot of others I'm forgetting right now, but lots of crazy weird stuff that uh, we haven't seen before or since. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, it, it's great to replay some of the those really early games that 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 are you know that, that still do hold up i mean a lot of them let's face it a lot of them don't hold up uh anymore and Yo, then, yeah, that's very true <laughs> and <laughs> there are some that are pure crap that's right and, and they're only they're, interesting they're really uh, because of their place in history i guess yes. but and they're uh, especially that early on uh it's it's almost the majority um uh, uh, of games, but some of them still work. Like, like I said, Alley Cat, Booter Title, 
plays like a charm and hell yep. that timer still works surprisingly yep. like you that you, was yeah that well you know what that was actually um that was programmed in 85 after IBM made their AT announcement and the programmer had access to an AT and so he immediately was like oh I'd better do this properly and so yes it is all timer based and it runs you can actually boot that game on a floppy That's disk right. on a modern core i7 and it still, still plays perfect. works I mean it's it's Love unbelievable it. uh, again I'm going to bring back to the other one that I have mentioned Castle Wolfenstein that I replay every few years I mean the more you play it the easier it gets I mean not not per not a perfect game by by any means but there is so much innovation uh, in it like all at once and I'm not even talking about you know the speech the speech is kind of just in there just no I know what you mean you're talking about the design the, the design of uh, being able to bribe I can you bribe guards in that game or is that the uh, second one? no you can't you bribe, can bribe them, but you can them. search yeah. them while you point a gun on them search, so, okay so, there you go so search, you them. search them then you shoot them <laughs> yeah exactly also I mean st uh, stealth that was probably the first game that uh, right. explored the stealth Absolutely. mechanic so I, I, I totally and agree and although the sequel is probably not probably sequel is for sure is superior in every aspect yet hmm. that's still the, the first game really really uh, really really uh, works somehow just something about it like I like to me although I played it you know most of my life uh, it's not just nostalgia it's a solid game so yeah of course there there are those games that will be there forever hopefully never forgotten by people who play them I'll tell you what uh if you're still doing DOS Nostalgia in 10 years and you've managed to start a family and you have young children, that's when you really get to see which games stand the test of time. <laughs> For example, uh, my son, who's uh, my youngest son, who's now 14, still plays Archon and um, when he has a friend over, they like to play Zill. I don't know if you've ever heard of Zill. Zill is this uh, 1983, uh, sorry, 84 um, real-time role-playing text adventure. We'll try to wrap your head around that. That's fine. It, I, I can picture it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's got, well, when you think of all this stuff, it's like, how can you merge all that stuff? Well, it's got two halves of the screen, mm -hmm. and each player takes one half of the keyboard to issue their commands, and you can either play competitively, where you're like fighting each other, or cooperatively, where you're both working towards the same goal, and it's all text. It's all like a text adventure. You know, go north, you see a cabin, you know, that kind of thing. And then if you just sit there and wait and the other guy moves to where you are, it'll then spit out, uh, John has arrived, you know, or something like that. And you're like, whoa, what the? So it's a, a real-time role-playing text adventure. Nice. He, and another, he and another teenage friend of his, they still play that. They ask me, every time the, that guy comes over, they ask me to pull out the disc <laughs> and fire it up. And sure enough, I do. So... That's how you can see, and I've tried to introduce him to other stuff. Um, I introduced him to Digger, for example, and he wasn't impressed. Right, right. But uh, Archon, you know, I think what it is, I think it's, um, I think it's the two-player aspect. Archon loves to play with another person. Mule, oh, and Mule, they play Mule. Uh, when the PC version of Mule was finally discovered at 18 months ago, I had a copy of it lying around, and he was interested in what it was. And then again, he and his friend play uh, Mule as well. So. It's funny. I think two-player games, vintage or not, if the game mechanics are solid, you know, kids will still play them if they can get past the graphics. Some of it also depends on age. Like when this, when my same son that I mentioned was six, we played Transylvania, mm -hmm. that, that PC game, and he was scared. The werewolf is coming. Nowadays, he played it and he's like, "This game is terrible." <laughs> and un unfortunately, I kind of have to agree. There's a lot of arbitrary stuff in the puzzles and. You know things that you wouldn't. You you pretty much have to just sort of pull out of thin air. It's it's Sierra is weird. really guilty of that yes. too. I hate to I hate to speak ill of Sierra, of but course. you know some of their games, man. I, I we could have a, we could have a whole show on what we don't like about. Sierra. I grew up as a Sierra fanboy. That's like uh, uh, that was basically very early on in the PC day in the PC sure. uh, sort of rise in Russia. The only adventure games available were the Sierra ones. There was sure, no, no, sure. not until like probably I think the first adventure game that got actually translated into Russian, uh, of course by enthusiasts, uh, oh, sure. um, was uh, the first Kirandia game, The Legend of Kirandia, the, the book one. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, before that, uh, there were only Sierra adventure games. So of course I grew up playing all those games, uh, and I was a Sierra fanboy and everything. But sure. 
Uh, it's, it's going to sound horrible well, as, some, as, someday, as well. Someday you can explore when you when you when you take the thirty thousand foot view of Sierra Adventures. Maybe then you can pick it apart. But remember, you have to. You can only really poke fun at it if you really love it. So it's not all that bad. Oh, of course, yeah. But I look at them now, and of course, it's like uh, a lot of them. Some of the, some of the really tough ones. I don't think I would have had the patience to. Uh, to sit through now or anything like that. Like uh, very few games back in the day, I I didn't play all the way through. Uh, even the it was, really it really was tough. tough ones. And yeah. a lot of games were tough one uh, tough back in the day because you know you spent however many dollars on it. You know, and I didn't, but you know it was a, sure. it was still the same games where it was assumed that you spend X amount of dollars for it. You should probably get. You know as much gameplay out of that as possible and a lot of games were you know some of the games were big and just really expensive and some of the games were just really really difficult uh and i played them all and en <laughs> enjoyed them all a lot of them that i would uh, we actually well you brought up weird dreams earlier that game is damn near impossible uh, yes it was it even then like i remember uh, well, try playing it on CGA. The guy, the guy who programmed it, didn't make any attempt to convert the graphics. He just picked uh, random colors. Oh. I swear, you look at it; it's random colors. I gotta in look CGA. that up because I, I know that game pretty well. Actually, I'm wondering if I like fired it up now, w would I be able to get past like the even like the, the second or the third level? <laughs> Which I, I can't. I, I remember like one once the girl comes up with with a knife. Uh, like I remember that moment. Like I'm in a flashback in 20 years now, but. Uh, it's like I remember that that moment, like the beating the girl uh, was was important for me somehow. <laughs> I just remember a huge cotton candy machine and a gigantic bee, and then I also that's remember getting crazy. Well, that's all I ever got to. I, I the, the graphics and CG are so terrible, and the gameplay moves so slowly. It was really a terrible port. That's another thing. That boy, the PC suffered from some really bad ports. Yeah, which is which is a shame. There was a couple that were fantastic. Um, had really nice converted graphics. Some of the early C uh, CinemaWare stuff, but uh, you know that's uh, probably that's probably a topic you know for another day. Probably, yes. We were just talking about Sierra Games and some of their horrible puzzles, and also talking about PC Junior and Tandy exclusives. Another thing that's exclusive to King's Quest, the booter version on all three platforms, is that the Rumble Stiltskin puzzle is much harder than it is in the later versions that, that most people pirated and passed around. In the in the version you know, um, the Rumble Stiltskin password is is I think it's actually either Rumble Stiltskin or it's Rumble Stiltskin spelled backwards. Right. But in the but in the booter version, you had to do this sort of cipher. There was like a code. Like it was oh the backwards hint wasn't for the name Rumble Stiltskin. It was for creating a cipher of, I think it was the letters A through Z, and then under them Z through A, and that's how you translated the name Rumpelstiltskin to these new letters. And then I think you also had to do that backwards. It was, in, it was impossible. So they actually, that's when they ported it to DOS, they made the puzzle much easier. Oh, wow. You know, in summary, there's uh, a lot of games that can showcase an early PC if you, uh, if you know where to look. And uh, and if you don't know where to look, grab whatever you want because uh, a lot of them are fun to play around with on DOSBox anyway. Absolutely. Well, well, folks, there it is. They, we had a a, a brief trip uh, into a different time now uh, for for a, a quick but very uh, interesting history lesson. Well, thank you very much, sir. Not not a problem. Anytime. I had uh, a lot of fun. Uh, maybe even you could come back in the future for for a discussion of a different topic. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. And uh, obviously, you're everywhere online. But if people want to contact you, where can they find you? Oh, you know, that's an excellent question because I'd also like to pimp a vintage computer festival that's coming up as well. Um, I can be found, uh, my website is trickster.oldschool.org, and that's my blog. Um, I have another website, but it's not maintained and somewhat outdated, so I won't mention that. Uh, you can email me at trickster at oldschool.org. Uh, trickster is spelled with an X, and old school is spelled with a K. But if you just simply search for trickster and old school, I'm sure you'll find me. And if you want to see me in person and yell at me, or for whatever reason, <laughs> uh, the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest is happening in Lombard, Illinois. That's about one hour away from Chicago in Illinois, uh, September 20. 
28th and 29th, I think. It's that weekend, the Saturday and the Sunday. And I will be there uh, both days, and I will be uh, setting up uh, some PC Juniors, actually, for people to use, a public exhibit. You can walk up and play some games or do whatever. Just don't break them. And uh, I'll also give a one-hour presentation on the history of the PC Junior. So if you're interested in that, and you can come find me and say hi. Oh, that sounds awesome. And uh, I can be found uh, on Twitter at Das Nostalgic or in the Das Nostalgia website or in Das Nostalgia. Just if you Google Das Nostalgia, any of those sources are fine, Facebook, whatever. You can contact me. And if you think you have an interesting topic to discuss on a podcast, uh, you know, you feel free to contact me with it. And uh, you could be here talking with me about some old stuff that people still care about. Or, you know, tell me just a few stories, da stories on Twitter that I always uh, happy to reshare with people. I love those. Oh, same here. You know, I subscribe to you and I, I, I catch your, your morning DOS talks with uh, uh, with great affection. Um, I probably should have mentioned that too. On Twitter, I'm uh, at Moby Gamer. So not Moby Games, but Moby Gamer with an R. And uh, yeah, I'll keep, uh, I'll keep uh, subscribing if uh, you keep writing. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, hopefully we'll meet again on this Dust Nostalgia podcast. Bye. Bye.